Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Sok Jun Kwan working at KIST and KIST School. I'm a principal research scientist holding an associate professor at UST, who is a main instructor of this course. Welcome to the lecture 3. In this lecture, I will introduce nano devices. In lecture 3, we focus on the nano devices. First, we will explore fabrication methods for the preparation of the nanostructures and processing nanomaterials for preparation of nano devices. For your understanding, we will learn about a variety of top down and bottom up approaches for the fabrication methods too. Next, we will explore measuring and observing methods for nanoscale, including nanostructures nanomaterials, and nanodivices. In this part, I will talk about a variety of microscopes such scanning probe microscope, scanning electron microscope, tunneling electron microscope, and so on, and their working principle. In the third section, I will talk about micro and nano electromechanical systems. Actually, these systems are very important for your research in nano science. If you want to use your nano systems for nano intermediates and nano modules for realistic applications. In the fourth section, you will be given a brief introduction to the nano sensors such as nano chemical, nano bio, nano optical sensors. Moore's law is the observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. The observation is named after Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Fairchild Semiconductor and was the CEO of Intel. Moore's prediction proved accurate for several decades and has been used in the semiconductor industry to guide long-term planning and to set targets for research and development. Advancements in digital electronics are strongly linked to Moore's Law, quality adjusted microprocessor prices memory capacity such RAM and flash, sensors, and even the number and size of pixels in digital cameras. Digital electronics has contributed to world economic growth in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Moore's Law describes a driving force of technological and social change productivity, and economic growth. There have been numerous innovations which successfully supported the Moore Law. 1. Since first invented by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments in 1958, integrated circuit was followed by MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field defect transistor. MOSFET is the key driving force behind Moore's Law. It was the first transistor that could be miniaturized and mass-produced for a wide range of uses, due to high scalability, making it possible to build high-density IC chips. It is the most widely manufactured device in history, with an estimated total of 13 sextillion MOS transistors manufactured as of 2018. 2. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor or often abbreviated as CMOS was invented by Cheteng Sa and Frank Wanless at Fairchild Semiconductor in 1963. CMOS technology have enabled the extremely dense and high-performance six that the industry makes today. 3. Dynamic Random Access Memory or often abbreviated as DRAM was developed by Toshiba in 1965. DRAM has made it possible to fabricate single transistor memory cells on IC chips. 4. The first commercial single chip microprocessor, the Intel 4004, released in 1971. It was designed by Intel engineers. 5. The first flash memory was invented at Toshiba in 1980, using floating gate MOSFET technology. This led to low-cost, high-capacity memory in diverse electronic products. NAND flash memory has since become the most rapidly scaling technology among electronic devices. 6. 
three-dimensionally integrated circuit chip was initiated in 1981 and integrated with a CMOS chip in 1983. Recently, an atomistic simulation predicts that the nano IR MOSFETs lie toward the end of the ITRS roadmap for scaling devices below 10 nanometers gate lengths. A FENFA tests three sides of the channel covered by gate, while some nanowire transistors have gate all around structure, providing better gate control. One of the key challenges of engineering future nanoscale transistors is the design of gates. As device dimension shrinks, controlling the current flow in the thin channel becomes more difficult. Compared to FinFETs, which have gate dielectric on three sides of the channel, gate all-around MOSFET structure has even better gate control. In 2006, 3 nanometers transistor was developed based on FinFET technology. In 2015, IBM demonstrated 7 nanometers node chips with silicon germanium transistors produced using OVAL. The company believes this transistor density would be 4 times that of current 14 nanometers chips. In 2020, Samsung Electronics plans to produce the 5 nanometers node, using FinFET and UV technology. The physical limits to transistor scaling have been reached due to sourced drain, leakage, limited gate metals and limited options for channel material. Other approaches are being investigated, which do not rely on physical scaling. These include the spin state of electron spintronics, tunnel junctions, and advanced confinement of channel materials via nanowire geometry. Basically, the current microelectronics heavily depend on the nanotechnology such as deep UV lithography, nanowire transistor, nanotube memory, and so on. The major obstacle for the Moore's law to be extended to future semiconductor devices roadmap is the reduction of the size. As shown in the right figure, we are witnessing 3 nanometers lined width, and this will be 2 nanometers in 2024. If research and development are still with top-down approach, the feature size reduction should be pursued by advanced high-resolution lithography process. The resolution of small feature or geometry is a function of wavelength of the light source. For optical light or visible spectrum, Optical lithography has a fundamental limitation in the determination of the feature size not under the 100 nanometers. This is due mainly to a fact that the shortest wavelength of visible light is greater than 350 nanometers. Therefore, we need shorter wavelength sources for the smaller feature such as electron beam or deep ultraviolet or edge lithography. Why can't we just use optical microscope or optical process to fabricate nanoscale devices? This is mainly because of the physical principle namely Abbe's diffraction limit. As many of you have already learned about the single or double slit interference in physics courses, there exists diffraction limit for the wave-like signals due to interference of waves. The interference pattern is a function of the intrinsic wavelength of the light and slit size. By slit size, we can think of the feature size of the sample. Let's think of the simplest light source which is a point source of light. Due to diffraction, a point source of light appears as a finite object described by the point spread function. The point spread function is called dairy function and the shape of the point spread function can be calculated as a function of the intrinsic wavelength and slit size. As shown in the lower figure of the middle column, typical diffraction pattern looks like ladder pattern with decreasing intensity from the slit position. Now, let's think about the multiple slit case. For each of the slit, diffraction of light will produce each of the airy function like light distribution patterns. If the two neighboring slits are close together enough, the point spread function will be overlapped. As shown in the right figure, two close slits or two close features will produce non-separable light distribution patterns. 
and this will look like a single slit of feature. Using some mathematical analysis of wave interference, we can calculate the resolution to be separable as a function wavelength and numerical aperture, NA. According to the Abbe's diffraction limit, the separable distance or resolution R is linearly proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the numerical aperture. Therefore, it is important to decrease the light source's wavelength and simultaneously increase the numerical aperture. In particular, it is important to increase the refractive index of the background, which is noted here as n, as large as possible to increase the numerical aperture. Now, let's explore the basics of some nanofabrications. I believe many of you are quite familiar with semiconductor process engineering such as lithography. The first and basic lithography is photolithography. By photo, it indicates that the process employs optical light source. The first step is preparation of flat and surface cleaned semiconductor substrates such as silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, indium tin oxide, and so on. On top of the surface of the substrate, thin polymeric layer is deposited. The deposition of the polymeric thin films is mainly done by using spin coating. The thickness of photoresist on the substrate is determined by spinning speed and concentration of PR in the solution. In particular, the thickness decreases with increasing the spinning speed and decreasing the concentration. By controlling spinning RPM and concentration, it is possible to prepare the polymeric thin film with thickness ranging from 10 nanometers to 1000 or thicker nanometers. There are other coating methods such as dip coating or spray coating. The polymeric thin film is called as photoresist or PR. The deposited PR is exposed to strong ultraviolet light source. For the micro-patterning, we can use a chrome-coated glass mask which is soda-lime glass or quartz coated with pre-pattern metallic thin film. In contact lithography, the photomask is in contact with resist. However, in projection lithography, the photomask is suspended slightly above the PR film. Resolution of the photomask is about 1 micrometer considering the optical diffraction limit. This is the reason why the photolithography is great for lab-scale fabrication not for industrial applications. Actually, photolithography suffers some drawbacks such as interface problem in which the contact induces surface damage in both mask and substrate. In addition it is difficult to obtain an homogeneous light illumination for the big substrate areas used in industry such as 12-inch wafers. To overcome the intrinsic problems of the photolithography, projection photolithography is used in industry. The pattern size can be reduced compared to the size on the chrome mask and the pattern can be repeated many times on different location on the substrate. It is an expensive process. The resolution is proportional to the light source wavelength. After the UV exposure, exposed areas suffer property transitions such that fully solvable to non-solvable to certain solvent. Otherwise, for some photoresist, UV exposure makes property transitions such that fully non-solvable to solvable to certain solvent. We will explore in detail in next slide. The pattern PR film on the substrate can be used for further process such as substrate etching or metal film deposition. The etched substrate can be further processed to remove the pattern PR layer. The metal film deposited sample can be further processed using lift-off process in which PR layer is removed. The photoresist film can be divided into two types, the first on is positive and the other is negative. Positive photoresist film suffers property transition from non-solvable to solvable. 
This transition is due mainly to the UV-initiated cracking or modification of the molecular structure of the polymeric film. Positive photoresist is advantageous in forming smaller feature size down to 500 nanometers. For example, as shown in the lower right figure, diazonaphthachino nanotubes can be used for sub-1 micrometer photolithography. In contrast, negative photoresist film suffers property transition from solvable to non-solvable. This transition is due mainly to the UV-initiated polymerization or curing process of the photoresist. In the positive photoresist film, the photoactive monomers can make polymerization upon irradiation of short wavelength external light source such as ultraviolet. Negative photoresist film has typically higher resolution limits such that 2 micrometers. It has some limitations compared to positive resist in that the conformal coating performance is worse than positive photoresist. However, it is less expensive than positive photoresist. Before the development of electron beam lithography, most of the lithography was photolithography. And it was very important for the research and development of microelectronic devices using shorter wavelength and more transparent photomask. For smaller feature size and better reproducibility for quality control at industry level. Typical range of ultraviolet spectrum ranges from 150 to 430 nanometers. In particular, we divide the UV spectrum into relatively longer wavelength sources such as UVA, UVB, UVC and shorter wavelength sources such as deep UV. For longer wavelength sources, there are G, H, and I lines UV which corresponds to UVA, UVB, and UVC, respectively. These longer wavelength UV sources are from mercury R clamp. Due to relatively long wavelength, sub-300 nanometers patterning was not possible till mid-1990s. The resolution limit had met the new UV source with short wavelength such as deep UV. The wavelength of the deep UV ranges from 190 to 250 nanometers. Some of the deep UV is from Mercursi arc lamp or krypton fluoride excimer laser or argon fluoride excimer laser. These deep UV sources had been employed from mid-1990s to mid-2000s. From the late 2000s, photolithography had decreased its resolution limit down to 30 nanometers using shorter wavelength UV called vacuum UV, which can be obtained from fluorine excimer laser. However, the fundamental resolution limit for the UV-based photolithography is much higher for industry-level feature size. Therefore, people have focused on another advanced wave source which is a focused electron beam. Electron beam lithography is the practice of scanning a focused beam of electrons to draw custom shapes on a surface covered with an electron-sensitive film called the resist. The electron beam changes the solubility of the resist, enabling selective removal of either the exposed or non-exposed regions of the resist by immersing it in a solvent. The purpose, as with photolithography, is to create very small structures in the resist that can subsequently be transferred to the substrate material, often by etching. The primary advantage of electron beam lithography is that it can draw custom patterns, direct right, with sub-10 nanometers resolution. This form of maskless lithography has high resolution and low throughput, limiting its usage to photomask fabrication low-volume production of semiconductor devices, and research and development. E-beam lithography is similar to photolithography. However, there exists critical differences from the photolithography. 
First of all, e-beam lithography has small spatial resolution for nano-patterning down to sub-10 nanometers, while it is typically limited for the photolithography to scale down to 200 nanometers. E-beam lithography's sub-10 nanometers resolution relies on the focused e-beam and its control. Second, e-beam lithography does not make pattern at once like photolithography. Instead, they control spot by spot, line by line patterning employing serial process. This is much like nano writing not nano printing. After resist development, following sequences are similar to those of the photolithography. Nowadays, typical resolution of the e-beam lithography is 2 nanometers. Before we get into other kinds of patterning process, it would be instructive for you to learn little bit about the etching. Etching is a critical step for the nano fabrication. The resolution itself is determined by the light sources and mask. However, the detailed shape and contact properties of the different materials in the chip is determined by the etching. By controlling the etching methods, etching isotropy can be controlled. Typically, gaseous etchant work to form isotropic shapes such that depth and plane directional etching rate is nearly the same. In contrast, in the case of anisotropic etching, depth direction etching rate can be increases by 10 or more times than that for the plane directional etching. This anisotropic etching is important to fabricate three-dimensional nano features. For anisotropic etching, we can use plasma etching such as ion bombarding which make heavy ions collide to substrate vertically, 